understand who Jesus was and is, to help me understand what this huge, daunting book called the Bible really says. He took time out of his life to do that. Paul got connected with me at a local church, at that Muskegon Bethel Baptist Church. He didn't know me very well, but he took a chance and he asked me if I would like to meet with him on a regular basis for a while. So I jumped at the opportunity. Paul was uh, purposed and he was intentional about making me a disciple of Jesus. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I was a baby in Christ and Paul transformed his little trophy house into a disciple-making classroom. Not really. It really transformed it into a disciple-making classroom. He, he moved his tools and his trophies out of the way, and he opened up his Bible, and, and he began to help me move to the right by showing me the rich truths found in God's glorious Scripture. Believe me, our time together was nothing fancy. No high-tech computer programs, no fancy videos, no elaborate PowerPoint presentation. It was just Paul, me, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. Listen, friends, it's our glorious privilege that we get to do the same thing. We get to be Paul Parker in someone's life. We get to invite them into our world and provide a Christ-focused relationship with them. Paul gave me an hour each week for several weeks. Eventually, we parted company. No doubt he began to work with someone else in his little trophy house. He did his part in my life for that season in my life. He made his eternal investment in my life, and then he set me loose uh, so he could engage into the next relationship that God had for him. And eventually I started doing what Paul did with me. And this is how it should be. He was not a pastor He was not a trained theologian. He didn't go to seminary that I know of. And yet he was a disciple maker. That's what he was. This is our duty. This is is our calling. This is our God-ordained privilege. We manifest Jesus to those who need Jesus the most. This is what Jesus did with his life as well. He came to, as Tony told us last week, if you were here for our conference, to seek and to save that which is lost. But not only did he come to seek and to save that which is lost, he came to continue to grow us into the image of Jesus. He came to make disciples. And when you look in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, there's a powerful verse here, and there's three things in this verse that I want to share with you briefly that says this, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, just that verse, whenever I read that verse, I just kind of (sighs) go, Do you feel that way when you read that? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first thing that we see here in this verse is a request by Jesus himself to come to me. Come to me. He's asking people, he's inviting people to come to him. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a responsibility to respond to pursue Christ. You and I have a responsibility to pursue Christ. But then he goes on to say the next thing that he tells us what to do. He tells us what to do and he gives us reasons why. The second thing I want you to see is he says, take my yoke. So come to me, but then I want you to take my yoke upon you. His yoke. He wants us to put this yoke. A yoke was something that animals would wear, uh, you know, a cow or a bullock or, or a donkey, and they would, they would put, a, put a bullock around their neck and team them up, and, and they would pull something or help, help them, you know, plow the ground or pull a wagon or whatever. It was a sign of labor for the animal. And Jesus is saying his yoke is easy. It's an easy yoke. Well, what does he mean by this? Well, it's a yoke that is way easier than the previous yoke. 
a yoke that we simply cannot bear. And what Jesus is talking about here is this. You continue to work. You continue to labor. You continue to do these things in hopes that you're going to somehow be right with the God of the universe. And that is a yoke you simply cannot bear. There's, there, there's not enough that you can do in order to make yourself right with the God of the universe. And you work and you work and you work in hopes that you're going to somehow be right with him. But he says, I have a much better and a much easier yoke for you to wear. He says, I, I, have, I have a yoke that you can put on. See, the yoke that we try to bear is, is the bad news of the gospel. Our works will end us up separated from God for all of eternity in hell. But he says, I have a much better yoke for you. And that's the gospel. We just celebrated it as we partook in the table, right? The death, the burial, and then ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by faith, if I repent of my sins and place my faith in Jesus Christ, I place his yoke upon me, the yoke that he bore on the cross, the, that he bore the wrath of God on our behalf so that you and I wouldn't have to labor in that sense. And so we enjoy the reality, for those of us that are in Jesus Christ, we enjoy the reality of this easier yoke. Because there's no way that you and I could ever hope to have that type of a relationship with God in and of ourselves. So he says, take my yoke upon you. Take it upon you. And then he says, learn from me. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to learn from me. It, 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 and, and this is what I want to challenge us with today as a church. God's given us a big, thick book that we have have the glorious privilege of studying and working through so that we can see the picture of Jesus Christ accurately and clearly so as to emulate him and to become more and more like him. This is our purpose. This is what we are to do. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Listen, in the month of January, I preached four sermons that focused on discipleship. And that, that was the theme, that's the theme of our church this year, and you can see it on the the. the uh, the thing here, the sign. I couldn't remember the word, the, the sign. I'm telling you, I'm losing it. Um, anyway, and so be one, make one. This is our theme this year, be a disciple and make disciples, okay? And after those, ser after those sermons were preached, we developed a discipleship team whose task was to ensure that our culture, our church culture, was inculcated with the spirit of discipleship from top to bottom. It was their task to figure out the best way to make this happen, the best way that we can learn from Jesus. We followed uh, some instructions from a wonderful book called The Vine Project, and, we, and that particular book uh, talked to us through many things, but there was one challenge that that book uh, challenged us with that we as a group took, took on, and that was to develop a discipleship manifesto. Well, what is a manifesto, you ask? Thank you for asking. Well, a manifesto is a written statement declaring publicly the intentions, motives, or views of its issuer, the intentions, the motives, or the views of its issuer. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a succinct little document that summed up what we want to try to accomplish. These are available at the Welcome Center, and they are free, okay? And I want you to take one with you, uh, but this is just a, this is what this team developed over months of work, a lot of work, actually. And I want to talk you through this today in more of a sermon format, if you will. Now, this group didn't work unilaterally and make, make it up on their own. They worked with the elders. In fact, there were some elders on the team. Uh, then, and, and they labored over the writing of this document, and they received feedback not only from the elders. Uh, we also brought it to the leadership of the church as, for them to review it as well. So today, I want to talk through this with you. I want to talk through the fruits of their labor with you. The, the Allendale Baptist Church Discipleship Manifesto. This is our written statement declaring publicly the intentions, the motives, and the views of discipleship here and discipleship at Allendale Baptist Church. 
So what? Big deal. Isn't this just another exercise in futility? How many of you, I've been in the corporate world uh, a, a portion of my life, and we came up with a lot of mission statements and vision statements and all that kind of stuff, right? And you spend hours and days and years, and you're working on this stuff, and you come up with a nice plaque, and you write it all out, and it's so nice, and then, and then we put the plaque in a drawer and never pay attention to it again, right? That's not a place to say Amen. <laughs> I understand what you mean, though. <laughs> that's, a, that's what we do, right? We, we, we get this thing, we work so hard on it, and then we never pay attention to it again. God forbid, and that is not what we desire uh, to do with this manifesto, okay? Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Now, this, this manifesto that we've come up with was not made up out of our own minds. No, this is rooted and saturated in God's holy scriptures, Remember, discipleship is God's idea. Discipleship is God's tool to conform us to the image of Jesus. Remember, we first come to him, we take his yoke upon us, and then we learn from him. Spurgeon said this is in a way that only Spurgeon can say it. You cannot be Christ's servant if you are not willing to follow him, cross and all. What do you crave? A crown? Then it must be a crown of thorns if you are to be like him. Do you want to be lifted up? So you shall, but it will be upon a cross. See, these are the sobering words that help us to understand what it truly means to be not only a disciple, but a disciple maker. It's going to cost us. You're not going to be elevated and receive all kinds of accolades necessarily in this life. In fact, you're going to receive a crown of thorns in some cases. You're going to be lifted up on a cross, Jesus said in Luke 9.23, that a disciple is to deny themselves, to take up their cross daily, and to follow Jesus. So it's our hope that this manifesto infiltrates the warp and the woof of this little church. And you're saying, what is warp and woof? I've said it before, and my kids are like, Dad, nobody knows what that means. All it means is the fabric, the warp and the woof, the fabric of our church. We want discipleship to be within the context. We want it to, everything we do, we want to be in the process of making disciples. That's why we exist. We want it to infiltrate our church. And the ideologies that are presented in this manifesto will so affect our values that our culture will become more and more of one that discipleship is in everything we do. And, pl and that, folks, pleases the Lord. So our discipleship manifesto starts with these words. These are not written by me. This is written by a collaborative effort uh, of the team. The purpose of disciple-making is that God would be glorified through the working of his people to know God and to become more Christ-like in their daily lives. This process, called sanctification, is the working of the Spirit of God in, in the individual Christian to transform their lives in such a way to infect others with the desire to become more like Christ. It is developed through the purposeful engagement of one person to another in order to invest the continuous transformational learning of God for the purpose of growing each other in Christ. Folks, this is what we are trying to accomplish as a church. We, who are individual believers in Jesus Christ, have been entered into the discipleship process that's the, that's the raw reality of it. When you become a believer, you are now a disciple. And you have a responsibility to grow in Christ. But as a believer and as a disciple, I also have an opportunity and a privilege and a requirement to help you grow in that fashion. Folks, we are not in this by ourselves. We need each other in this whole discipleship process. So there are five questions that this document attempts to answer, and I'd like to share those with you today. And, and they are, what makes a disciple, or why make disciples, rather? What are disciples? How are disciples made? Who makes disciples, and where are disciples made? Those are the questions that I want to address with you today. So here they are. Why make disciples? Well, 
First and foremost, Jesus made disciples. As an imitator of Jesus Christ, we should follow his example of leadership and invest in others. Ephesians uh, says this, Therefore be imitators of God as as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Jesus made disciples. He came and the first thing that we see him doing in the Gospels is collecting his disciples. He's going around and and encouraging people to follow him. He was very purposed and very intentional. He was very prayerful about getting disciples. He spent an entire night in prayer before he called the apostles to be a part of his team. Jesus was a disciple maker. Absolutely, 100%. That is why he came. Why? Because he wasn't here long term. He was going to go to the cross. He was going to pay for our sin debt. And once he was resurrected and left, he left it up to a small band of fishermen and the like to transform the world. This was his plan. Jesus was a disciple maker. That's why we should make disciples. Secondly, discipleship glorifies God. We need to glorify God through the transforming of others into the likeness of His Son. Folks, when you get the opportunity to sit down and talk with someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we'll call that pre-discipleship or evangelism, and they come to faith in Christ, they turn from their sin and they repent, and, and and they become a follower of Jesus Christ, we get to help them move along incrementally. Now, you may have a window of time with them. Maybe it's a month. Maybe it's six months. Maybe it's two years. But you don't have to do the whole thing. Paul didn't do the whole thing with me. He played a part. And sometimes I think we overwhelm ourselves with this idea that I've got to do all of this. No, you just have to do a part. But the point is, is as we grow, as we help people to grow in Christ's likeness, God is more and more glorified. Why? Because their lives more and more accurately represent God and represent the God of the Bible and represent Jesus Christ. So the more they grow in Christ's likeness, the more you grow in Christ's likeness, the more glory that God gets. It's not just about us, it's about God. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 10 says, After this I looked and beheld a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, surround, or standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's going to be you. That's going to be me. That's going to be our friends over in Pakistan. Tribes, nations, tongues, we're all going to stand before God because somebody did some pre-discipleship and discipleship. We all are going to, if we are in Christ, stand before Him and praise Him. He gets all kinds of glory out of that, doesn't He, folks? So discipleship, uh, why why make disciples? Jesus did. Discipleship glorifies God and then next, discipleship rescues people from darkness. Listen, this is our glorious privilege as we, as we endeavor in this process. We get to help people cross that line of faith. They get, to, they get to walk from the kingdom of darkness and move to the right, past the cross of Jesus Christ and become believers in Jesus Christ. We rescue them. I think that's a marvelous word. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, He has delivered or rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. So why, why make disciples? Because Jesus did. And because it glorifies God. And because it gets people out of hell. They don't have to spend eternity writhing in hell. They have the opportunity to become children of God. We rescue them. Well, that leads us to our next question. What are disciples? Well, our manifesto addresses this. Uh, They're not just sinners, but saints. They're not just sinners, but saints. Forgiven sinners who are engaged in the transformative learning of Christ in repentance and faith. 
You know, oftentimes, even as Christians, we fall into this trap of, well, I'm just a dirty, rotten sinner, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Are we glad for that? Amen? But if that's all we focus on is that we're sinners, we forget about the fact that God has called us children of His. We, we forget to focus on the fact that we are not, we're not just sinners, but we are children of the Most High God. And we focus our energies. We're saints. Hagias. We're, we're called to be holy. I think about that for a second. That God. I know me. I know my heart pretty well. And, and yet God, because of the shed blood of Christ, and I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, God says I am a saint. That's what we need to focus on. And we need to help people focus on that. Yes, when we're going through the evangelistic process, they know that they, they need to know that they have offended a holy God. But when they come to faith in Christ, we need to help them understand that that is old and now they are new. So not just sinners, but we're saints. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that, that, that word Lord, kurios, is the same word used in the Old Testament for Yahweh, that we believe Jesus is God, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We become children of God. But not only are we just not sinners, but saints, but we are saints on the move, folks. We are saints on the move. We are not to sit and soak. We are to move. We are to do. We are to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. We're saints on the move. Saints who are constantly making progress in Christ-likeness by learning the truth found in the word of God and transforming their lives in every way they think, everything they say, and everything that they do. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16-18 through 18 says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond and all comprehension, as we look not at the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They're going away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. We're saints on the move, folks. We're growing. We're pushing ourselves. We're, we're pushing ourselves to grow in Christ's likeness. And we're pushing others along with us. So, what are disciples? These are disciples. Not just sinners, but saints. And, and we're saints on the move. Well, how are disciples made? Well, first, by the Word and the Spirit of God. By the Word and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God works through the people of God using the Word of God to infiltrate and motivate the hearts of people. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is the Word of God that works in tandem with the Spirit of God to help conform us to become people of God. That's true prior to our salvation. I remember that day when God infiltrated my heart with his powerful word and transformed me and I became a child of God. It didn't stop just at that point. I didn't just become a baby and lay there. I'm a baby. I mean, we just we have little baby little baby Sonny in our uh, family now. Just a little, and and folks, I want to tell you, she is as sweet as can be. She's gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful little beautiful girl. I love her. It would be a tragedy if baby Sonny stayed baby Sonny. It'd be it'd be it'd be grotesque if after twenty years she was still this little baby. Why is it any different with us as believers in Christ? When we're born, we're born to move forward. We're born to grow. And that happens through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And folks, to the extent that you engage in the Word of God, the Spirit of God is able to grow you into the image of God. That's on you. You need to be people of the book. So we want, disciples are made by the Word and the Spirit, but secondly, 
by equipping the saints. So not only is it just on you, it's on us collectively. The equipping of the saints, the equipping of others for encouragement and transformational learning through preaching and teaching, the proclamation of the Word of God, given proper instruction about Jesus Christ. This is so important. Why isn't it kind of weird to you that we get together every? I mean, from I wasn't always I wasn't always one of you. It's kind of weird that we get together on a Sunday and we sit down in this auditorium and you hear some nerdy guy talk about stuff, right? I mean, what other what other where where does this even happen? I mean, they do some they do some TED talks on on YouTube and stuff, but. But where does this happen? Maybe in a school or whatever. But by and large, this is a very unique thing. And it's ordained of God. God has said that preaching the word is what he desires. He desires for people to preach the word in season and out of season, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy. We need preaching and teaching. Paul says this in Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call on them on them who they have not believed? And how will they believe in him who they've not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? For it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Now I don't know how beautiful my feet are, but it is a great privilege for me and anyone else who stands in this pulpit or who stands in one of our classrooms and opens up the word of God. And preaches and teaches his truth. It's a marvelous calling. But it's not just preaching and teaching. It's also prayer. Prayerful dependence on the Spirit of God. Only the Holy Spirit of God brings life and true growth in the lives of his followers. And we need to be constantly depending on prayer to God for that progression of growth in Christ. We need to be people of prayer. You need to go before the God of the universe on a daily basis. And I want to tell you, I know for a fact in my own walk that when I am spending time in God's word and spending time praying his word back to God, I am growing and thriving. When I unplug from that process, I start descending. It's just like clockwork. And if you are a Christian here today and you spend precious little time in the Word of God and precious little time in prayer, I'm willing to bet you're struggling. I'm willing to bet at least you're struggling with apathy. We need to be people who are people of the book and people who are on our knees, but also, thirdly, work. We need to be co-workers with God. People, the pe- people as God, God followers are his fellow workers. God chooses to use those whom he wills to reach the lost and encourage others to grow in his Christ-likeness. We are the instrument that God chooses to accomplish his will and to bring him glory. You are an employee of Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that you are a slave unto Christ. What is a slave? How many rights do slaves have? Not many. Now, if I'm going to be a slave to anybody, I want to be a slave to Jesus. Because I'll tell you what, he's he's taking good care of me, and he will take good care of me for all of eternity. If I have to submit my life to anybody, it makes the most sense to submit my life to Jesus Christ and work with him. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no better work than working with Jesus Christ and helping people to grow in Christ-likeness. I'll just share, share with you. It's kind of funny. This morning, I got a call from uh, Mike Christie. He's like, Mike, Mark, we, we, are, we don't have enough communion cups. Okay, what do I do about that? And so he's like, do you know anybody? And so I'm like, well, I'm kind of racking my brain and thinking. So I thought, oh, I know. I'll call Luke from Lakeshore Baptist Church, and, and I know they use the same kind of cups we do. So I called Luke up. Now, Luke was in, my, in our youth group. He's this, this guy in our youth group. So I called Luke up. He's now a pastor there. And so he's like, I, don't, I, I can't help you with that, but you could call Eric Johnson because he's in charge of communion. Okay, Eric Johnson. He was in my youth group. So I called Eric. I said, Eric, we need some cups. He's like, well, I'm not doing that right now, but you can call this person. And so... The long and short of it is we got enough cups, okay? Praise the Lord for that. But it struck me that for years while I was working through in the youth ministry, you know, there were days where I'm like, are they getting it? 
Do they hear me? Is there anything getting through up here? And it was hard and it was laborious. And now I see that that's just two examples. Derek's another one who is in our youth group growing up. And, and I see godly men that have grown up. I had a small little bitty part of that. And I want to tell you, folks, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than to be used by God to help people grow in Christ-likeness. And then lastly, perseverance. Perseverance. Persevering in, in, in everyday life, step by step, becoming a Christ learner is a day-to-day -day transformation by the continuous renewal of our minds patiently and perseveringly over time. It's not the kaboom, I'm super Christian. It's not how it works. It's two steps forward, one step back. It's three steps forward, four steps back. It's two steps forward, one step back. It's a constant going up and back and up as we head more and more like Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. We persevere, and we persevere, and we persevere in our own walk and in the lives of others. I'm looking across the room here and, and thinking about the, the privilege that I've been able to have, whether it's long-term with you or short-term with you, to invest in you. And what's exciting to me is seeing now you investing in other people. It's happening. It's taking place. And I want it to grow more and more. Number four, who makes disciples? Well, just the pastors, really, right? And the elders and, you know, the deacons can be in on it, too. Who makes disciples? Every believer. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't get a pass. You have to be involved. You get to be involved in this glorious process. All believers under the authority of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit are to make disciples. So every believer makes disciples. But then also, more narrowly, the pulpit ministry. Now, you might find that to be a surprising, uh, surprising point. Pastors, elders, preachers, teachers use the pulpit and the classroom ministry in such a way that we can reach a mass amount of people. For us here at Allendale Baptist Church, the sermon, the Sunday sermon, is a focal point to equip the saints to be Christ learners, who, who then in love help others to learn Christ. See, I have the opportunity to study. You guys give me the opportunity to study the text of Scripture, pour over it, and then bring it to you. And then in our small group ministries, we're able to take that text and, and talk about it and bring, bring some application to it. And so that's a, one way we can do it. But there is a whole lot of work that can get done. It's amazing to me how many people will come to me up to after the service and say, when you said this, you were speaking just to me. Well, and, and I think some of you think that I'm just thinking just about you during my preparation during the week. I'm not. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's able to do a great deal of work, and I think he does more effective work the truer we are to the text of Scripture. That's why, in large part, we work through books of the Bible. I'm going to be starting Habakkuk here coming up, and you're like, Habakkuk who? Tobacco? What? Yeah, because we need to know what was going on with that prophet and those things that he dealt with, especially regarding the sovereignty of God and God using who he wants to when he wants to. There's some great truth in that book that's very applicable to this day. So, the pulpit ministry is huge. Uh, we call it the flagship of our discipleship process. Everything has to, has to flow from here, if you will. If we're not preaching the word from here, if we're not making a big deal about preaching the word from here, why would we make a big deal about preaching the word in our equipping classes or in our youth ministry or in other places? The word of God needs to be exalted from this pulpit. And listen, if I ever stop, you have full permission to come and don't slap me too hard, but slap me and say, what is up? Preach the word, brother. All right. 
Even Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 says this, for, I did, for, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, let, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Isn't that beautiful? The Apostle Paul saying, my job is to preach Christ. My job is to preach the word. Number five, why are disciples made? I'm sorry, where are disciples made? Where do we make disciples? Anywhere and anytime. Anywhere and anytime. Christ learners can be made aware uh, from the family dinner table to the mission field. It doesn't matter. In your workplace, as Tony talked about to us last week, raising the flag and, and helping people to understand that you indeed are a follower of Jesus Christ and you want to invest in their lives. And that's not something to be ashamed of. That's something to be encouraged about because you have answers for what they are facing. You do. If somebody is discouraged, you have the book that, that deals a lot with discouragement. You can come alongside them and encourage them. You can... You can Share with them the truth of eternal life. You have the answers. Listen, I want to encourage you that you can make disciples anywhere and anytime, but secondly, and more specifically, in your circle of influence. In your circle of influence. Our lives must model the image of Christ so they reach everyone, no matter where they are, to draw them into the community of Christ learners. This is our glorious privilege. So every one of you have a circle of influence. There are people that you meet with and you spend time with that I may never spend time with. And God has sovereignly orchestrated you to be in their world so that they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that you can help them to grow in Christ likeness. Why did God put me an Italian adopted little baby into a home of Hollanders 50 years ago. I think he strategically put me in that home so that I could be a witness as time would go on. Where has God placed you? Don't, don't discount where God has placed you and what he has done in your life to get you where you're at today because he desires to use you within your circle of influence. Paul says these very important words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jew I become as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I become one as under the law. Though I myself not being under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Folks, do you hear what he's saying here? Whatever circumstance he finds himself in, he morphs into that particular role and he speaks to them on their level. That's what you and I get to do. You've been given all kinds of experiences, all kinds of opportunities. Tony told you last week you should develop multiple testimonies for various situations that you find yourself in. And you need to be nimble, being able to switch your feet on which testimony and which way you can minister to that person. Is it a Jewish person? Then I can go that way. Is it a Gentile person? Person, then I can go that way. Is it a guy who works in a shop? Then I can go that way. And you start to be nimble and thinking through, I am all things to all people that I might win some to Christ. That's our goal. So the summary of the, of the discipleship manifesto is this, and this is what the team wrote together. God has drawn us together at Allendale Baptist Church to be a Christ-learning, disciple-making community. Amen. To hear his word, his voice, and to let it transform our lives as we gladly respond to his teaching. For by our faithful private study of the word of God and participation in the equipping courses of this church, we are further prepared to be and to make more disciples. We are one church body with many different parts and gifts, but we serve one God and we desire to make Christ famous by each playing our part to share Jesus with those who are lost in darkness. Repentance and forgiveness of sins must be proclaimed to all. There is no one that is unworthy 
of saving. We were all once lost. Now having believed, we are free to serve others by prayerfully speaking Jesus to them, moving us all one step closer to his light. We are all learning about Jesus and maturing in our faith. We, we all purpose to engage with family, friends, co-workers, community, and to the furthest reaches of this world. We will continue to learn Jesus, speak Jesus, model Jesus, and be Jesus' hands and feet until we see him face to face. Isn't that beautifully written? The team did such a great job with that. Listen, Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm lowly of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, why, why do we need a discipleship manifesto? Isn't that kind of weird? Why do we need this? I'll tell you why. First of all, because discipleship is God's only plan for his church. And we better know. We better know how to do it. We better be really good at it. And this discipleship manifesto will help us focus our minds on that. Number two, because we, his people, are easily distracted from his purposes, right? We get onto something and then it's squirrel and I'm over here. The goal of this document is to keep us on track. It's, it's, it is our hope. It's my hope that every ministry of our church, the nursery, the children's, the youth, the equipping classes, finance, worship services, our family chats, our connection groups, our, our visitor outreach program, our, our greeter and usher ministry, our counseling, our missions, our buildings and grounds, our, our church planting and revitalization, our men's ministries, our women's ministries, our college and career ministries, our audiovisual ministries, our music ministries, every last ministry that we have at Allendale Baptist Church needs to breathe and bleed discipleship. And then lastly, because we must be found doing what he asked us to do when he returns. The Bible's very clear. He will come again, and we do not want to shrink back at his coming. Are we being the disciple-making church that he called us to be? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. C.S. Lewis said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. Paul Parker was doing that for me. Paul Parker invested his life in me. It wasn't fancy, it wasn't spe spectacular, it wasn't high tech. It was him, me, our Bibles, and his willingness to share his life and understanding of God's truth with a young, cocky, hungry, new believer in Christ. Paul helped me move to the right. And I'm eternally grateful for that. I would say I'm standing here today in part because of Paul's ministry in my life. Friends, this church is made up of individual people. We are a whole unit. But we are individuals. As a whole, we must embrace discipleship as a mindset if we're going to please the Lord and thrive as his body. You know why churches are dying? Because they're not embracing discipleship. They're not reproducing. But this decision must be made by each one of you. We can talk about it all day long as a corporate body, but if you reject it, as an individual, it's going to be more and more difficult for us as a corporate body to accomplish this. I have decided, and we need to make this decision every day, but I, need, I have decided to be a disciple maker. Will you join me? If you don't know how, that's okay. I'll make sure you know how. But my question is, will you join me? Bill Hall said this, all who are called to salvation, are called to discipleship. No exceptions, no excuses. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the discipleship team that put together such a marvelous document for us as a church. 
Thank you that we could take a minute today and go through this and just understand the fruit of their labor. God, please help us not to tuck this away into a drawer somewhere and never see it again. But may it be part of every aspect of our church life, from nursery to youth to children's to wherever in this ministry, Lord, that you would see fit. Everything that we do, may it just bleed discipleship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.